Well, thank you very much, uh, Aurelio. It's my, um, my privilege to um, have this opportunity to, uh, to talk to you today. Um, I prepared a presentation where I go over uh, what I think are really interesting questions. And then um, I like data, so I'm going to show you some data. And then while I'm doing that, I'm going to talk to you a bit about how I do research and then um, try to link that to the whole point of business. Um, what a business is about, what is the purpose of the business? Given the purpose, what are the priorities of business? Given the purpose and the priorities, how do we actually practice it? And of course, it's a feedback, right? How we practice it, that really sets what our real priorities are. Like you can look at what people actually do to see what their priorities are. And their priorities determine how their purpose works out. Now, why study corporate governance? My simple answer is because corporate governance is about everything. And I'm interested in everything. You can think of the positive side or the negative side. <coughs> Initially, when I was doing my um, PhD, um, with, kind of withdrawal actually, uh, at Stern, I was doing methodology in, uh, in financial economics. My background from Mellon's uh, was all in, in statistics and, and metrics. And while at Stern, I kind of learned that I'm not that much interested actually in just doing econometrics, just studying methodology, but I became much more interested in the economic questions that you can use uh, econometrics for. So I s more and more started to think about econometrics as a, as a means, right, to, to some other act. And the, the, the other end would be the really interesting economic question by itself. And um, that's also why at the end of my PhD I started to uh, uh, branch wider, and so now I, I think I'm a bad example for you because uh, I work on too many different things. Um, but I really enjoy doing so, so I'm, just, I'm also on apologetic about it. What are businesses about? Well, in my mind, this is really about creating value for everyone connected to business. That includes financial value, and that's what we study in finance, um, but it very much also uh, includes many other types of value. Anything that fulfills a genuine human need, right? that is value creation. And financial value is a really an essential part of that, of course. Um, so if you think about financial, if you think about the purpose of business as the creation of, of value, and the creation of value for everyone connected to the firm, um, you also get an issue of sustainability and corporate social responsibility. Right? Sustainability is, is making sure that all the stakeholders benefit also future stakeholders. And that brings us to some debates about what is the purpose of the firm and, and what is the purpose of finance. And I'll get back to that at the very end of the presentation. When I was finishing my PhD, we had a whole wave of corporate governance scandals, a world government Android. That's what, we, what got me interested uh, at, at that time. Like the current financial crisis, I think, is also something that uh, is a very natural way to, to start thinking about uh, interesting questions. Very recently, um, I started to become interested in behavioral finance. Business is about people. It's about creating value for people. It's done by people. And individual behavior matters, both in markets where ultimately it's individuals right, who come together in markets. And at large firms, the CEO and the boards are individuals, and, and they, are, they have a very large influence on what happens in the firm. And so their personal behavior matters. I'm also interested in corporate governance because there's so many different things to think about. There's so many different mechanisms. Stakeholders is one example. I'm also interested in corporate governance <coughs> um, because it's, it's, it has a lot of interactions with um, where business meets other aspects of uh, of how we organize our world. For example, the public sector, the government, regulators, and all kinds of institutions. This is a really good time to study regulation. A big trend over the last 20, 30 years or so is that finance has become more and more institutionalized. I'm going to show you some, some basic numbers 
But in 1980, when our good data starts on institutional holdings, about 25% of US, 25 of US equities was owned by institutions. Today, it's close to 75, 80% of US equities are, are owned by some type of institution. That's an enormous change. And I think we're still uh, working on trying to understand what that means. And so all these institutions themselves right, have a particular purpose. Um, there are individuals there that, that matter. Uh, they use different mechanisms. Um, they are regulated. And so all of these then uh, will interact with how these institutions operate in the market, how the markets operate, and the feedback effects. And so I think a lot of interesting issues uh, in, in there. Um, <coughs> I apologize for my, for my call. Please bear with me. Um, so a little bit on, on, on behavioral finance this is my most recent uh, thing I'm trying to understand even though I know very little about it. Uh, my advice if you're interested in certain questions, you don't know much about it, make sure you, that your co-authors uh, know a lot about it. <laughs> so anytime I branch into some new area of finance that I know very little about, or finance as people say in New York. Um, I always try to make sure that at least my co-authors know what they're talking about. Um, and this is not a co-author, but um, Carl Schultz <laughs> explains these things much better than I do. So this is a uh, <coughs> little guy says to Lucy, why are you always so anxious to criticize me? Well, I just think I have a knack for seeing other people's faults. What about your own faults? I have a knack for overwhelming. I think that's a that, that's a central theme in behavioral finance, our sense of overconfidence. School president, me? Where are not? I'll be your day manager. But I can never be school president. Think of the work. Think of the responsibility. Think of the power. Ah. And that's a common theme, I think, in corporate governance. We humans have different motivations. There are some internal goods associated with finance, with what we do in business. There are also external goods. The external goods are things that are not directly related, but that are byproducts, like status, power, pleasure, money. So how do we think about the internal goods that finance produces? I'm going to talk more about those later. In connection with those external goods, and both of these are goods, you know, good things. Um, there are different ways to think about it. I think that's also where I think finance can, uh, has a role to play in the study. <coughs> then many different mechanisms of corporate governance. You have boards, you have shelters, shelter rights, corporate law. One of the things that I, I've been doing really a lot over the uh, past years is to start work with legal scholars who work at, uh, at law schools. And I find that I can learn a lot from them. Um, they take a very different approach on, on data. But in finance, we tend to look at the more data, the better. Um, law schools, you actually start with anecdotes. You start with individual cases, and they think hard about every data point. And so combining uh, is, 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 is a lot of fun. M&A, executive compensation, restructuring, activists or institutional shelters, media, family control. And so <clears throat> the way that my research uh, somewhat optimistically have, has evolved over time is where I take one of these mechanisms and, and try to understand them, um, but often try to combine them. Um, in my mind, to try to be creative is often to try to, to form new connections, uh, try to combine different ideas, different things that, that um, are not typically combined. Uh, this is the example that, that Raul gave us, just one simple one, that, right? You have the bank crisis and, and sovereign banking crisis, bank, banking crisis and, and sovereign banking. Um, so all of these different mechanisms you can think about uh, as being, uh, as interacting or not, or how, the, how, do, how do these all relate. That's some data. <coughs> the, um, the, the thick green line is the percentage of US equity ownership that is in the hands of institutional investors. So the data starts here in 85 and ends recently. This is, is the axis on the right. So in about 85, you're about 30%, and today we're getting close to 80%. But that's the big trend 
that, that I'm talking about. And much of this trend is actually in the, in the last 10 years or so. And as, as my uh, thought is that we're still at the beginning of understanding um, what, what that has really changed. Of course, anything, any time that in 10 years you see such a big change, right, it takes a while to understand it because data is slowly going to be available, and oftentimes to reach any conclusions, but right, you need a fair amount of data. Um, the, the, red, um, <coughs> the red line on the bottom is measuring how long these institutions hold these stocks in their portfolios. To take an institution, take $1 invested by the institution to take a stock, how long has $1 in that institution's portfolio the last five years been in that institution's portfolio? That's what we call the stock duration. What we find is that that stock duration has been very stable over time. So institutions tend to hold their, uh, their equities in their portfolios a little bit less than one and a half years. And that hasn't really changed. So yes, trading has increased about sevenfold because trading has become much easier and cheaper and liquidity has increased. But these institutions are not responsible for that. Right? It's really a high frequency phenomenon. And these institutions are generally not high frequency traders who typically close out their positions at the end of the day. Then you can dig deeper. I'm all, I'm going, I'll get back to the institutional <coughs> durations. Yes? <coughs> All of this is 13 okay. All these are quarterly volumes. So that also means I'm completely ignoring any round trip trades done by institutions within the quarter. Okay. Um, other research that has much better data than 13 s has argued that uh, most of these institutions actually do very little round trip trading uh, within, ever, the, within the quarter. Have you ever uh, done a full of daily trading? That's, that's my next step. I, I just um, contacted, I think they called Abel Moser. They, uh, they, they have data on, um, on institutional trades daily. So you don't know who the institutions are, but you have really detailed data on their, uh, on basically, uh, trading data. What are those I think it's called cable nose. Okay. So well, there's a bunch of papers now that have that data. Okay. So I want to use that tool together with the third kind data. So this tells you a little bit about who those institutions are. So here I just split up the, the institutional holdings in four different types. Um, first, the banks. If you think about these as bank trust companies, where the banks don't own these equities directly, but they really own these directly, uh, own these equities on behalf of, of some clients in the bank trust department. And you see that banks have been very stable over time. And they own about 14% in 85, and that's similar to where you are today. Of course, you went down a bit uh, in the recent funds request. Then pension funds over about 4% at very stable over time. Then others, that includes university endowments, sovereign wealth funds, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and hedge funds. <coughs> They've been, uh, as, a, as a rest group, very minor, and just recently the hedge funds typically have overtaken the pension funds in importance. But the really big story, right, where all the increases come from, is really the other category of investment <coughs> company holdings, which I interpret as mutual funds for retail and institutional investors. That's where all the growth has been. And that's also why I'm primarily interested in my own research. I have, I, I'm doing research on, 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 on early on banks and pension funds, and not yet on hedge funds. Um, but most of my research interests are uh, trying to understand these investment company holdings, uh, how these mutual funds for retail institutional investors behave. Yes. So it looks like the trend probably coincides with the increase of index investing. Absolutely. Can you break down your institutional investment index? Because they are. Yes, I have a slide on that. Yeah. Uh, so I'll. we'll. we'll um, um, so what are key characteristics of mutual funds? <coughs> For those of you who haven't done. Um, so the portfolio manager, right, these are managing money on behalf of a third party. So you have different kind of agency issues. What are the incentives of the money manager? What are the incentives of the clients? And how, how does that potentially, uh, how, did that, how does that institutional money manager agency problem, how does that play out? 
that those money managers um, are hired by some mutual fund family. That family itself is an institution, right, with its own corporate governance, with its own ownership structure. Um, these can be public traded or private. They can be mutually owned, like, like Vanguard. And, and how does that uh, play a role? The incentives, um, size plays a big role. Like the larger your fund, the more fees you have and, and uh, the more money you make. And much of in the, in the industry, I think, is about performance relative to some benchmark. So it's really relative performance evaluation that, that seems to be the most important in my mind. Most of these are very well diversified. And they're also constrained in, in, in different ways. For example, they have a particular investment universe, a particular mandate that they have to follow. Most of these are long only. Um, they typically have fairly short investment horizons. Okay, talk, about, talk about being myopic. Most uh, mutual fund managers worry about the next three to six months for the stocks they own. Very rarely do they care about over, the, over six months because by the time they're going to have, they, they will have sold these equities. So what does that mean? Typical portfolio turnover is 100% percent year. Now each mutual fund in the United States has its own board, but that differs across, uh, across the world. It's dominated by independent board members, uh, but many of these independent board members are board members of a large number of different funds. <coughs> this slide gives you some detail on individual institutions which is the other part that I find fun. Right? Yes, you can talk about large data sets, but you can also go to the micro level and, and study individual institutions. So the, the top blue line, this one, that's Berkshire Hathaway, by Warren Buffett's investment company. Um, its duration right now is about four years. So at least for the publicly owned equities, though a lot of what he owns, of course, is not publicly traded at all, but a lot of the public, equi public equities in his portfolio, he holds them for about four years. Um, Fidelity uh, was quite short term in the beginning. They become more long term, partly because I think they, they go more into uh, index funds. It becomes more important. Uh, Calcers Ohio is a simple example of a, of a public passion fund whose holdings are fairly stable about two years on average. And then the University of Chicago Endowment, you see that they have become much more short term. In the beginning of our cycle, in 1985, they hold stocks and portfolios. About two and a half, three years, but today slightly over one year. So the University of Chicago actually has to become much more of a hedge fund, uh, or more a mutual fund rather than a long-term owner. So trying to understand why this is, how how does this matter? How is this related to how they behave in the capital markets? How is this related to, to the performance? How is this related to corporate governance of themselves and of how they behave as owners? I think are all issues I'm currently interested in. <coughs> then by group. You see that the pension funds have the longest durations, then banks, then investment companies, and then the hedge funds. Not surprising. The hedge funds became uh, very short term in around uh, in 2000, after 2000, and they uh, become a little bit less short term these. To my surprise, and this is also where data is found, the asset priors, and then you, know, you get kicked by the data, and you realize, well, the priors are wrong, so you have to revise. Uh, I had thought that because turnover has increased so much, there's so much more liquidity, the trading costs have gone down so much, that surely those average durations, the average length of time that institutions own uh, equities, notwithstanding the, the, the criticism of, um, you know, we're ignoring round trip trades, what round trip trades is important. Right? Um, again, other research argues that that, um, that, is, that will likely not completely change these results. What you see here is that the average durations are very stable over time. There's no clear trend. Um, even though much of the trading increases have appeared here, even before that, right, it's very stable. Now, who is short term? Here I focus on institutions that have an average holding duration of less than six months. But the minimum holding duration you can have with, with quarterly data is three months. Right? So these are institutions where most of the portfolio changes um, within the half year. Overwhelmingly, these are the mutual funds, like what I call the investment company holders. Uh, <coughs> banks have become less important in this group. Um, 
tangent fronts almost non-existent, and hash fronts also. Uh, yeah, they are, again, a very small group. So if you want to think about short-termism, if you want to think about um, myopic investors, right, then I think looking at these uh, <coughs> some So is short-termism a problem? My most recent paper um, tries to argue, tries to document, that there's some kind of a herd effect. Um, it's really a very simple story that we try to tell. We look at uh, the percentage of affirmatives owned by these really short-term mutual funds. And then we look at what happens to the price of the firm if the herd moves in or the herd moves out. So here in, in, in purple, you see the percentage, the, basically the, um, the duration uh, of these investors. You see here a huge downward uh, spike. Right, that's the event we study. Like what happens if all of a sudden a lot of short-term investors come in? The, the, and then what you see is that that is unstable by itself. The huge short-term guys move in, that's our event. What you see then is the strong mean reversal. So the herd moves in, but the presence of the herd, the short-term herd, is by itself in, uh, predictable. It's predictably unstable. You know it's going to mean reverse. What we see then for valuations, you can do this for stock returns, you can do this for market-to-book ratios, you look at all different uh, misvaluation measures. If, what we find is that valuations tend to go up. Uh, while the herd moves in. And then as the herd moves out, which takes much longer, can take up to two years, um, or, or even longer, you see that valuations come back down again. And we interpret that as this, this, this spike, we interpret that as some type of misvaluation that is driven by the herd moving in and out. Now some people in this herd will do very well, right? If you go in here, the acts are there, you're gonna do great. But other sorts of investors, of course, well, they add to here, they actually there, and so they're going to lose. So on average, the short-term investors will not, neither underperform or nor overperform. It really depends where in the curve you are. What I'm currently working on then is to try to take this asset pricing story, which is kind of really behavioral finance, um, and try to think about what the government's in the kitchen. The story that we try to um, Tell, the way we try to explain it, that has to do with, <coughs> with overconfidence. And so we think about which of those individual institutions may be more likely to be overconfident than ours. One simple thing we do is we argue that if you have been very successful, right, um, you're more likely to be overconfident when you find some results consistent with it. A little about to, uh, I don't, sorry, I don't know your name, but your question about index funds. Um, this is about <coughs> how different these institutional portfolios are relative to the benchmark weights or the market weights. If you compare the holding weights in, in a mutual fund to the, the weights in the benchmark, right, how different are these? So what, we, what, what I call active share. <coughs> what this graph tells you is that for large cap active funds, these are over 80% of the market. Most of these funds, in my mind, look very similar to the market weights. Um, only a couple of percent have active shares above 90 percent. Now think about how easy it would be to get a manager active share if you're a large cap manager. Right? You have the whole Russell 1000 to choose from. The typical large cap manager owns about 100 stocks. Well, you have a thousand to choose from. Right? You have to choose a hundred out of the thousand. If you do it completely random, you don't care about the benchmark, you're going to have 10 percent out of the thousand funds, stocks, can have an overlap of 10%, so an active share of 90%. If you don't care about the benchmark weights, if you just choose 100, hopefully not random, uh, stocks out of the, uh, uh, out of the uh, Russell 1000, you're already going to have an active share of 90%. So you see that very few managers actually do that. In blue is 80 to 90, and so you see a lot of managers have benchmark weights, which are fairly similar to the weights in their um, in their, uh, in their benchmarks. It's also a recent threat. Like, there was almost no cost indexing before 1990. And the cost indexing has just uh, really increased over the last 20 years. It's also an international phenomenon. I just did a paper with uh, some co-authors where 
we find that plasma imaging is much more prevalent outside the United States than in the United States. And we try to link that to some measures of, um, of market competition in this market for, uh, for mutual funds. So in particular, the, the competition between the passive index funds and ETFs versus the actively managed uh, equity mutual funds. So how effective can mutual funds then be right, as, as models? Well, they could if they, if they Ex ante, they could, right? They, they own over half of the equities. It's also fairly concentrated, concentrated industries. The, large, the 10 largest families are the bulk of the money. <coughs> but on the other hand, they're very well diversified, so they don't typically have that much at stake at a particular company. Many of them are really short term, and they're also constrained. And they're fairly, one of the constraints they have is they really care about relative performance valuation, which I think is what drives their fairly, typically fairly, uh, low active shares. <coughs> so they don't simply don't have that much at stake. Right? They don't really care about one particular company. There's a lot of positive things. That by itself leads to interesting corporate governance questions. Like to what extent is that an example of a conflict of interest between the fund and its clients? How much time do we have? So five more minutes. And finally I want to go back to my first point. And if the, val if the purpose of business is to create value for everyone connected to the business, then what is the purpose of finance? <coughs> um, the way I think about that is you start with the why question. But that's about purpose, the strategy, or where you want to go. Then the next is, well, how are we going to do that? What are the main problems to overcome? Right? That's about the tactics. That's the, that's the, the how question. And finally, you have to actually do it. Right? That's uh, how we actually going to do it. The what question. So the why, well, in my mind, simple. It's just making better financial decisions. The how is about risk sharing, and the what of implementation is about efficient allocation of capital. In my mind, finance is really about financial service. It's making sure that your clients' needs are being met, and by doing so and doing well at, at, at doing so. Um, you do well for yourself as well. So to me, it's about creating value, potential otherwise, for everyone connected to the firm. <coughs> One of the prime mechanisms that finance uses to do that is this idea of risk sharing. For that, we need better information on returns and risk. That's what finance provides, what the markets provide as well. <coughs> um, and this risk sharing allows individuals to share, um, but it's not clear at all what happens to aggregate risk. And that's also what we saw in financial prices. Yes, we've been very, very good at sharing risk. Right? Um, mortgage uh, debt ended up all over the world in the most obscure places. And so yes, we're very, financial markets are extremely good at sharing risk. It's much less clear how much, how that is related to the aggregate risk. Maybe it's even, I think you can look back at the financial price and even say that some of the, uh, this financial risk sharing has actually maybe increased the aggregate risk. Right? But because we no longer knew where all the risks were, um, and that led to, to some extent to a panic. <coughs> How we actually go about doing this? Well, we use markets. Right? We, we use markets to officially allocate this and make sure we actually can do risk sharing. And then we have markets provide better information that allow us to make better financial decisions. So markets are really about freedom, because freedom orders to something greater beyond, beyond itself. It's a freedom order towards, it's not just about efficient allocation of capital, it's about doing that for some, for, some, for some other purpose as well, which then includes risk sharing and making better financial systems. So that's about markets, about incentives, and, and about outcomes. So that's how I think about, about the purpose of finance. Given that, how do I think about the purpose of, of what we do, right? academic research. Um, my advice is not to take my advice. <laughs> uh, that has, of course, a, a, a self-contradiction. But what I really mean is don't take my advice. Um, let's, let's think about what Plato and Aristotle had, had, had as advice, really the founders of, um, of Western civilization. Um, they said, well, really to be, to be happy as a human, um, we need three things. 
but we need truth, goodness, and beauty. And I think these are the three keys to thinking about you know, what it is that we're doing. And these are things I aspire to, right? And so this is not about you know, uh, what, I, what, I, what I do, but very much about what I try to do. <clears throat> the truth answers the why question. Well, what is our purpose? And what, what, what do we try to do? And how we go about that is about goodness. And, and what we actually do, uh, hopefully, is beautiful. Now, truth about purpose, these, these should be things that you study that you really care about. If you're not going to care about them, right, how are you going to convince anybody else that this is interesting? It takes a long time and so much effort to write a paper. If you're not really interested in it, you know, you're going to be bored out of your mind. And you, one of the really hard things in our profession is to persevere. Right? You write a paper, and that's kind of exciting in the beginning. It takes three, six, twelve months, maybe longer. Right? Then you send it around, send up some conferences. And as you, you, know, you incorporate feedback, you send, it, you send it to some friends, you incorporate more feedback. And then at some point, you're going to send it to a journal. It takes three, six, sometimes twelve months to get it back. And think about how long this whole process is taking. Right? You have to really truly care about these things. You have to think that they really matter for you and, and for the world. Otherwise, uh, yeah, you're just not going to persevere. <coughs> and then you have to be really, really, really convinced that what you're looking at is, is, uh, is, is the right story. If you, have to, if you have trouble convincing yourself that your story is in the data, then just stop right there. Finance, academic finance is very much about your relationships <coughs> with everyone else in the community. Um, that includes the whole literature. It includes your, your colleagues. Um, very importantly, of course, your, your co-authors, uh, your colleagues at both your own institution, but also at other institutions, your students, PhD students and otherwise. Um, and in many ways, these relationships are more important than uh, many other things uh, in the professional world. And here, for goodness, it's really important to always think about your co-authors as and themselves, not as a, as a means to, uh, to get a paper. Then for beauty, um, because you, you spend so much time on this, I think it's also really important to try to make it beautiful. Right? The way you write, the way you argue your points, uh, the details of the paper. Um, again, these are things I aspire to, right? Not, not what, what I necessarily uh, am able to do. <coughs> now, part of, part of beauty is also a certain lightness. We don't take it too seriously. Right? So it's, beauty has this, 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 you know, once you try to grab it, you kind of lose it, right? Aspect of it. Um, it's my favorite quote about research, and I'm going to end there. Um, this favorite quote of research of mine is, is by Liz Bin. <coughs> I was told that Albert Einstein said it. If we knew what we were doing, if we knew what we were doing, it would not be called research. And that helps me a lot uh, when I do research. Is, you know, to, uh, yeah, I often I don't know what I'm doing. And I often come home and you know talk to my wife and it's always kind of the same thing. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what I did today. <laughs> you know, what do I, what, what, what do I, you know. Papers always take much longer. And often I start out one way and then I figure out, no, I was completely wrong and then I do another way. Then I write a paper and a couple of years later I kind of rethink what I did. So um, we, 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 sh we should take academic finance seriously, but our own role and how we exactly we do is uh, go about it. We should not take it too seriously. Very good. Uh, questions for the board. Go ahead. Uh, regarding what you said about purpose, I was surprised that you started with uh, financial decisions rather than welfare. Why? Why is that? about creating value, right, which you can describe as welfare. But finance in particular, right, within that, studies financial decisions. Um, at least that's how I think about it. Now, finances, financial decisions have an impact on, on, on can study value creation, particular financial value creation. Um, 
And that will have interaction, of course, with, with welfare. So welfare, uh, I think about the, the equation of value for everyone. Right? That's, that's the welfare. And that includes financial welfare for everyone, but also many other types of welfare. But the job provides you with many different things. Yes, it provides you with an income. But it also provides you an opportunity to develop as a human person and provides you with very meaningful relationships that you have by, by working. And so it's, uh, having a someone work um, has much more value than we measure uh, you know, in, in, in the statistics of how, one, so how someone works. That's one of the reasons I think we're still in a really severe economic crisis today in the United States, because so many people are either underemployed or unemployed. And so yes, we can study pension markets and it looks great, but at the same time there's still a lot of um, people who are not benefiting. Um, you, you're talking about uh, institutional investors and corporate governance. Uh, let's say, suppose we find that uh, um, firms with better corporate governance have higher ownership, institutional ownership. Um, my question is, um, so I guess people's question will be, is that due to um, institutional monitoring or uh, is that due to uh, let's say institutional investors select the firms with be better governance uh, to begin with. No, great question. Um, very difficult question to answer right? because these are all, you know, uh, use the big E word, they're all very industrious decisions. Um, so it's very difficult to answer. Um, so for just to, 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 to at the very least, I think papers should try to, to come up with some. Um, variation in, in uh, both ownership and, um, and and firms that seems to be largely exogenous. Um, and I also think that paper should try hard to try to take the alternative seriously. If the paper has a particular story to tell, I really appreciate it if the author also really try to think hard about the alternative view. Like how, how can we refute what our main story is? Uh, if a paper is only to, trying to convince you that yes, yes, this is this is a story, this is a story, this is a story, um, and have completely ignored, you know, what what the alternative is, I often wonder, you know, what what is there, uh, how much have the authors really thought about? It reminds me of the something that that people always said that Robert Rubin uh, always always asked. You know, people would come into his office with some idea, and, and then you would typically ask them, right? So what is the uh, what is the worst part of your idea, or what is the idea you rejected? Right? With, with this um, simple example is uh, this uh, paper showing that MA works out better if you have large institutional ownership. Okay. Um, and then a recent paper showed that that seems to all be due to the selection abilities of managers. That some managers are better at thinking about what MA deals are going to work out. Exactly how they do that is a separate question. But just look at the track record. They have been fairly successful, these mutual funds, in picking the right MA deals in the back. And so by looking at whether or not they own it, well, those MA deals turned out to be more successful. But if they don't own it, their MA deal actually was not successful. So that paper then argues that, that the previous results that try to argue that MA works better if, these, um, if, if you have monitoring by institutions, well, maybe it's no monitoring at all. Right? Maybe it's all this selection available. Um, and that's, I think, where the alternative hypothesis, taking that seriously, I think, is, uh, is, is part of your answer. 